Okay, so Sam, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> how has thirty two sounds done in the US, and what's your hope for its UK screenings? Ah, well, in the US, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a bleak time for documentaries at the box office, and but in that context, it was like a smash hit for a independent documentary about sound. Um, so that that was like surprising and you know, nice, and I don't know, somehow it, it has tapped into something, and, um, but with the UK, it's unclear to me. I mean, a lot of distributors now are not going to make any money off a theatrical run, really, and so they just want to sell something to TV or a streamer and be done, so I don't really know. I'm happy to show movies in movie theaters, and I like that, and, and we talked on the phone, and I said the sort of old model of a distributor is a little bit out of date anyway, so. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I'm happy to be here and happy to do that. Absolutely. What um, a great theater. Isn't it? Isn't it? Um, I'm so pleased it's the garden, because what I asked lots of different settlements, and the garden was the one that went, yeah, we want this. And um, <laughs> it's my current favorite cinema in London. I, you know, I'm madly in love with the whole concept of it and the fact that um, Michael Chambers, whose baby it is, or well, decided in retirement to build a cinema and create films rather than yeah, just buy a villa and the yelp and all the other things that people do. So I'm I was really curious about your range of documentaries because back in two thousand and two, as Arafini mentioned, you made a documentary that was Oscar nominated about student radicals, terrorists, depending on what you're know, called, the weather underground. But since then, you've made films about the Guinness Book of Records, The Architect and Futurist Batman Stifola, The Invented Language of Esperanto, Fog, Various Musicians. I mean, how do you choose your documentary subjects? Ah, um, just out of curiosity or something strikes me like I'll see an image or read a detail about something. With this movie, it really was, a lot of it was that I read, I said this in the voiceover, I read it, a book about a composer named Pauline Oliveros. And in it was one line, a reference to her lifelong friend, Anaya Lockwood, another composer, who had recorded the sound of rivers for 50 years. And that just really got me. I, I love the sound of rivers, and I thought, who is this person? It also said, she has an enormous river archive. And so I got in touch with Anaya Lockwood, I, I actually Googled her, and it was right at the beginning of the pandemic, and I I found her website, and I emailed her. I really, I'd never heard of her, but I loved her work. I saw a bunch of stuff online, and I, I wrote her. I said, could I talk to you sometime? I'm really interested in sound. And she said, why don't you call me this afternoon? <laughs> and so I called her, and one of the things, I, I asked her all these questions, but one of them I was like, where is the river archive? And in my mind, it was like a seven story building with like a staff, you know, and she laughed because it wasn't really that. But she, so this movie came out of that and all of the movies I've made have come out of similar things that are just curiosity and being intrigued by something. I mean, what struck me was that the film has got a lot of archive in it, going back to the Edison footage and all that kind of stuff. But also it's got your archive in it. So it's it's kind of layered. So there's things from you know, the um, room tone sequence. I was thinking, that's Rebecca Solnit. Yeah. That's Laurie Anderson. That's definitely John Cage. You know, I'm not quite sure who that bloke is. But it just struck me that you were kind of scavenging through your archive whilst talking to people about their sound archives. And that was rather lovely. And I wondered... How did you make choices? Because it's quite an anthology film. It doesn't have a timeline. It, there's nothing to kind of say next sequence has to be this. So it could have been any film. Yeah. And how did you make the choices you made? It's, I mean, everybody, uh, there's nothing more boring than hearing filmmakers talk about how hard a film was to make. <laughs> but this one actually was very hard because it doesn't have a main character or a chronology or any kind of conflict. You know, all the things that you can wrap you know use as a spine for something so it really was just initially at least like things that struck my fancy um 
I read a reference to Mazen Kirbaj in that recording, and I heard it and just was really taken with it. Or the the Moho Bricadas, I really did go to the British Library Sound Archive and asked, you know, asked her a million questions, but one of them is, what's the most striking recording? And she said that. And so it just, I think a lot of it came from curiosity and just things that resonated with me. But then after a while, once we started to put it together, then certain themes were there. And so the, the, the things had to kind of like resonate with those ideas. So at some point I made the 433 thing with John Cage and then I thought, Oh, all these room tone things I've recorded. I always love them. I I've, I've often been struck by how neat it is when you film somebody and they just sit there suddenly not performing anymore, how their face changes. And so I just thought, Hey, I could go back and find a lot and put it together. What would that be like? So it just it was sort of a combination of trying to craft something, but also just being open to whimsy. Mm. And tell me a bit about the way the film's been presented. When I saw it in New York, it was a sort of standard yeah. speakers all around the cinema, no headphones. Yeah. And then you do it as a live performance. This is the most confusing thing in the world. And people, <laughs> you just describe it and people are like, what? I'm confused. But it started off for a long time. I've made live cinema pieces, which is all the elements of a movie, but it happens live. So when we first started showing this, I would narrate on a stage, do the narration that's in the film. J.D. Sampson would play the music and we'd show the movie. So it would, and it, it's a little different because it's not a, a DCP or anything like that. It's just a bunch of files on my computer. So I would, so it's basically the same, but it happens live. And I like that form. And everybody wore headphones in the audience. And that was neat. I like that. And we did that for a long time. And then Film Forum asked if we would show it. I never thought it could be like a regular movie without being live. And but it seemed to work, and so then we started showing it that way. And sometimes it's no headphones, sometimes it is. It just sort of depends on what the theater wants to do. And I like having something that can exist in a lot of iterations. I think it's important if you're making films to be making things that are have a lot of different avenues. I mean, what struck me this evening was when I saw it in New York, Without headphones, I was aware of the audience yeah. and their reactions. So, for example, the little section where your dad is leaving a message on your answer phone about, hey, do you want to have some space in the burial <laughs> plot? Do you want to be buried next to me and all the rest of it? The audience really laughed. Yeah, but which I'm not, I like. <laughs> yeah, because it's great. You know, the voice from beyond the grave yeah. talking about the grave. Yeah. Um, it's just a great, great audio. Um, but... I wasn't aware of the audience laughing this evening, but I don't know because I, I had headphones on. Was anybody else laughing? Yeah. Yep, good, good, okay. Yeah, so, so there's a slight kind of, you're not with everybody else. It's interesting because when you're watching a movie, a regular movie in a theater, it's one of the only times where you have a sort of odd collective experience with strangers. You sit next to people you don't know or you know in your row there's people you don't know and you all go somewhere together in this strange way and i love that that's the magic of cinema and headphones when you're listening to something on headphones you're totally alone in the world it's one of the most intimate alone experiences you can have and i do like having sort of both of those together and in there 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 even with headphones there's different versions of the headphones there's one version where we have people take the headphones off at a certain point, which we didn't do tonight. But that's interesting because then suddenly you're you're actually with the other people in the theater. So, yeah, that's what I was curious about. And your previous films, you've had not just J.D. Sampson, but you've had the Cronus Quartet and Yolo Tango and done live. How does that work? Well, so I made a movie before this about the Kronos Quartet. It's a portrait of them, and they're an old classical music ensemble. And they play the soundtrack, and I narrate it, and it's about them. So it's fun. You know, I, I even make fun of them some, and they're sitting right there. So it's like a, a fun form. But that one, sometimes people had said, why don't you make it a regular movie? And it's it's odd, because that one, part of why I think it's a, strong work 
is that they're sitting right there. You're learning about them and you're saying, oh my God, they're right there. Those people that have been playing for 50 years and also they're playing amazing music live. So there's a charge that comes from liveness, I think, that is different when it's just recorded. And also as a filmmaker, it becomes a performance event and the economics are different and yeah. Yeah. I mean, it pays differently. It pays better. <laughs> Who would have thought like a filmmaker would be like, God, the live performance world really has got it going on, but it does. Yeah. So what I'm really aware of with this film, it's, it's about sound, but it's also about loss and memory. And I, it's quite moving. It's almost like a meditation. And I wonder, do you get strange reactions from audiences sometimes? And does it depend on whether they've had the live narration version? I, I have made a lot of movies and I've been surprised this movie ha gets strong reactions from people. And often people will say that scene with the uh, Edgar Schwery listening to the 11 year old tape, like I was crying. I don't understand why necessarily, but I do. I have a funny thought that I think like, we all went through an incredible, tra incredibly traumatic couple of years in COVID. And after that, just like, boop, it was over and we're done and we're moving on. And there was no, you know, I thought in the beginning of COVID at the end of it, there would be like this national holiday and everybody would like <laughs> market and we would burn effigies or like give medals out or some way to say we're done and... You know, but that never happened. But I, I do think, and this might be wrong, but I do think there's a well of feeling that people have that comes out in weird ways. I, 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 I was thinking the other day, I read the novel, The Tin Drum, which is a great, amazing novel. And there was something I always remembered in it where after World War I, I believe, in Berlin, it was, everybody was devastated. And there was a bar in this novel, The Tin Drum, on every table they had um, a cutting board with onions, raw onions, and you would sit at the bar and cut up the onions so people could cry. It was a way that they could have feelings, and I do think there's a little bit of just, there's a lot of feeling out there, so it might be that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it is a COVID movie without a single mask being in it. And it is so striking as somebody who reviews films all the time and you see the time lag and you see a film that you think, ah, oh, this is only two people in one location. They've done yeah. this so that they didn't have to worry about infection and all the rest of it. And you see documentaries where people are wandering in and out with masks. But this one just has that kind of, yeah, something happened. We were on our own yeah. in our is isolated, you know, our lockdowns with sound and thinking about people we were losing. I mean, it's quite striking. I've just got one more question because this has got a really good answer and then I'm going to let everyone else do Was there something that you filmed or thought about filming that you left out? A sound element? Oh, yeah. Tons. I could make 32 more sounds. Okay. <laughs> but I was thinking about the Spanish library you told oh, me about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um... Early on, J.D. Sampson was like a great muse and collaborator. And I said to J.D. early on, I was like, God, I, would, I don't want to make like a boring PBS compendium of sounds, like all the sounds you'd expect. There's even a podcast about sound. And it's like the sound of the Apple computer that, you know, it's just like nothing that surprises you. And so I was saying to this to J.D. And J.D. said, um, well, have you heard of the Orgasm Library? I said, no, what's that? And apparently there's a Spanish, not apparently, there is a Spanish adult products company that has a website, and as part of the website, you can upload any recording of you or somebody else having an orgasm. And so there's hundreds and hundreds of them, and it's not porn in a weird way. There's no words, it's just people making sounds, and it's really interesting. And we did a early sketch of this called seven sounds and use that. And it was great, I liked it because it's a, those are sounds that always get a reaction. Either people are embarrassed or they're like upset, you know, or somehow turned on or, you know, like there's nobody who's neutral to those sounds. And it was just really like 
striking. It was interesting also that so much of sound is what you make of it. You know, it's the same sounds going in everybody's ears, but everybody has a different reaction. So I love that. And we tried to keep it in for a long time, but it just, there's like a, an odd flow to it. And that just kind of made things go off into the ditch a little bit. But if you're ever bored, <laughs> it's pretty interesting. I, I once did something, uh, a piece about a woman who made um, pornography for women. And one of the things she said to me was that all the noises people make come from the porn industry because in real life you don't do all of that but in order to make the films more exciting you make those noises so i mean it's not quite true Foley. yeah Foley, yeah, yeah like exactly Foley. there's a kind of like oh i need to be making this sound in order to be like the people i've yeah. seen in the films anyway but i think i should let other people questions there's one back there man with a white, white sleeve a white sleeve it's very dark Hi, um, thanks very much, Sam. I enjoyed the audience experience with um, the headphones. Obviously, I hadn't seen the film without the headphones, and then enjoyed how you use people, um, nature, music as well. I was wondering, do you ever think about using crowds and, you know, sort of sporting events in this? <laughs> That's so funny. Um, one of the sounds I didn't use or wanted to use, I read about the world's loudest crowd. And it was a basketball game in the United States, the Sacramento Kings. And they have an arena that's super resonant. And they knew this, and so they got Guinness Book of Records to come with a decibel meter. And they got the crowd all riled up, and they broke the world record for the loudest crowd. I thought, this is great, because it's an awesome sound. A crowd, you know, it's like this operatic, you know, huge sound. And... So I watched a video, it was on YouTube, and it was like, I turned it all the way up and it wasn't that loud, you know? Or it was pretty loud, but not like the loud, you know, somehow. And I asked Mark Mangini, the sound designer I worked with, I said, how, how can we use the world's largest, loudest crowd? And he said, um, you can't. <laughs> you would have to make it so loud to sort of make the equivalent to that, people would be very uncomfortable. The loudest crowd is not so hard on your ears because you're feeling it. You know, a lot of the experience is just being in that room and the echo and all the vibrations. But in order to make something feel that loud, you'd have to really punish the audience. And he said, no. So I wish I could use the loudest crowd. I was thinking about different emotions within the crowd as well. You yeah. Win winning and losing. And totally. Winning. Yeah. Those are great sounds. Do we have any other questions? Come on. Oh, I was going to ask. Uh, yes. Sorry. One here. Do we need... Do we need um, well, I can no, no. speak up. No, no but they can hear you. It's coming oh, okay. towards you. <laughs> Sure. Um, I was uh, thinking, as we were just talking about the different iterations of the film, do you think people feel kind of proprietary about the one that they've seen? Because I feel this one belongs to me now. And you, you've, seen, you've seen more than one. Everybody oh, can, everybody who, who can own the version one. they see. It's theirs. <laughs> and I'll always tell everybody yours is the best. <laughs> Um, this is also a sort of version question. Um, it's a question about um, hearing it with headphones and without. Um, in the bit about um, the alternative this uh, to surround sound, where we have someone walking around your head lighting matches, I felt uh, his breath in my ear. Um, is does is does that exist in a in a non headphone version? You asked the greatest question. And um, the answer is, if, you, if, you, if I showed the film earlier tonight in a different theater with no headphones, and it was a 7.1 surround sound system, which is pretty good, you can get it to feel like things are moving around, but you can't get, and Edgar says this, the scientist says it, you can't get proximity. You can't make it so you really feel like they're right next to you. So it's that part is not quite as good, but the 
jet plane going overhead, for example, is much bigger. With those headphones, we had to really, I, I was like heartbroken because when we were mixing that, we had to keep bringing it down. Because at a certain point with those headphones, it just becomes like static. So some things are better and some things are not as good. But the certain, the magic of the binaural effect is not quite as good. Anyone else? Yes, back there, Arafil. When I saw it, the um, the airplane yeah. in New York, that you could feel it. Yeah, yeah, you got the vibration. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, thank you for making this film. I love it. Uh, uh, it's it's good to see. I'm a sound designer, so I'm always preaching about sound, and ah. so it's great to see. <laughs> so, but like to film like this. Um, my question is twofold. Is um, have you found that since making this you are listening to things differently and uh second do you think that will influence your documentaries going forward as well uh, the f the answer to the first question is yes and it was it was just through meeting anea lockwood really had a big impact on me and doing a lot of research on john cage I, I think for the most part, I'm like most people where you have to close your ears off to most of the sounds. There's just so much noise and sound. We couldn't have open ears. We have to. So you end up being all the time in this sort of defensive crouch with your ears closed. And hanging out with Anaya Lockwood and talking to her a lot made me realize like, oh, just every once in a while paying attention and opening your ears is such a great thing. A, it can be very pleasurable. John Cage was interviewed a ton of times and asked the question, what's your favorite sound? And he always said, the sound of traffic outside my window on 6th Avenue. And it's a loud traffic sound. But that idea that almost any sound can be very pleasurable, even things you think of as yicky or bad. I was in New York City and I was at an intersection. It was dusk and... It was one of those funny things where like four cars had taxi cabs that all pulled out into the intersection so they were all stuck. <laughs> and the, everybody was just laying on their horn. And it's the kind of thing normally you'd be like, ah, oh, it's terrible. But I just sort of sat and thought like, this is a symphony. This is amazing. This is great. So there's that just taking pleasure in sound, but also using sound to um, to be present. So much of our lives is our phones or thinking about other being elsewhere and sound can allow you or you know i sense this through an alacquid it can allow you to be present in the present moment and in your body in a way that's very pleasurable i think so and definitely with the second question very quickly is i learned so much about sound and and production sound and post-production sound that I certainly will use that going forward. I, I, I learned how little I knew about sound before, which is sort of embarrassing. Most documentary filmmakers don't know a lot about sound. A couple of more questions. If... Right here. Oh. Hiya. Um, is there a version, a mix of this that, uh, that for headphones, which, which also uses the low frequency speakers, to feel it um yes but we didn't get that tonight did we <laughs> that's a complicated version because there's a version where we do headphones and and yours is better i'm just telling yours is the best version but i'm just telling you this don't have any fomo but there's a version where we use the house sound system too and that way you can use a lot of the low subwoofer and people feel it you know so it's a little different but like i said no better this One lady, more question. This, la this lady here as well. Can we get two? Oh. Yeah. 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 Good. I was just thinking that it must have been a very different experience editing this film, which is so directed by the sound by Mark. And I just thought, wondered if you could talk a bit about that, how what you'd learnt in that editing experience. Ah. Uh, well, I mean, in some ways, it's similar in that. There's still ha the the challenge with editing this movie was it can be in any order whatsoever, you know. There's really no inherent order to it, so it still has to go somewhere. 
you know, and, and like the Mazen Kirbaj and the bombs, for example, early on, we had that very early in the film and it just, it's such a intense and it just wouldn't work It like no pun intended, but blew the movie up. And so figuring out the order, but that's not necessarily a sonic thing. That's more like a storytelling thing, but there certainly was a lot of, um, one of the big challenges was like when to get people just to listen, how many sections could we do of that? And when was that? And they can't be too close together, you know, being sort of like having a rhythm of listening, talking, you're hearing words and stories, but sometimes you're just listening and figuring out how to weave those sections together was a big challenge. And I like people listening. It's nice just to listen, but sometimes when you try to do that, people get bored. So how to make listening moments that hold you. I, uh, for a long time with the bird, the Moho Bricatus, I couldn't really make it so people would listen. And I edited a lot of different ways. And then I put in a shot of Cheryl Tip listening. And somehow seeing her listen made you listen. And that was a key. I realized like, oh, that's, there's some interesting device there. So she looks a little bit like a bird. There's a kind of way she's holding her head and, and the way you frame her with just one eye, there's just something quite bird I never thought that. Mm. She'll be happy to hear that. I hope so. There last was, question. Last question. Yeah, um, I was struck that most of it seemed quite like airborne sounds. So I was wondering how many of the 32 are more hidden. So like electromagnetic, mechanical, cash machine type sounds that because that didn't I was trying to work out where you'd numbered them where some of those things might have been laid well, by airborne you mean like well yeah you talk a lot about listening with it with your ear so ah. these are things that you can't hear oh, so you've gotcha, used the gotcha. bats you've got what like the, ultrasonic yeah. sound almost and you've got the hydrophone them, there was but, not almost all of them are airborne sounds yeah I'd that's say. that's that's what I thought so there you could do couple, another you could almost do another film with you totally could you with totally, other 32 sounds. <laughs> Low frequency sounds. Yeah, there was one like I wanted electromagnetic to, stuff where you're using yeah, bone conduction. I thought of that yeah. at some point trying to, but there was one sound I couldn't use, which was um, there's certain the older you get, the worse your ears get, especially for high frequency stuff. And so there's certain sounds that teenagers can hear and dogs can hear, but grownups can't. And so somebody made a product based on this called the mosquito and it's for stores and to put out front so teenagers don't hang out and so it makes a weird pitch and if you're a teenager you don't want to you don't want to stay there and i thought it'd be really fun to have a mosquito and just see if any teenagers you know see who can hear it and who can't but that became sort of like too i don't know it too far afield in a weird way I've also heard it doesn't work. Really? Mm. Mm. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. People pretending they could. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think we, we should probably stop. call it a night. Um, Sam, lovely film, fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, I'm Saskia. so glad you got to London. And thank you, Eric Feely, Patrick, and the cinema, which is one of my new favorite cinemas in the whole world. Yeah. Thank you. Is that first? <laughs> Number one.